All right, I'll give you a quick context of the passage. So we have here, we have the walls of Samaria. The city of Israel is surrounded round about. They're besieged like the Bible uses that, that phrase all the time throughout the Bible. And this was, a ta- this was a common tactic that armies would do to one another. And the, the whole purpose was to try to starve out their enemy, to try to not let anybody in and not let anybody out so that they could go get food. So whatever food is inside there, that's all they have to eat. And then, and I, let's start reading there in verse number one. The Bible says, <clears throat> Then Elisha said, Hear ye the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord, Tomorrow about this time shall a measure of fine flour be sold for a shekel, and two measures of barley for a shekel in the gate of Samaria. Then a Lord on whose hand the king leaned answered the man of God and said, Behold, if the Lord would make windows in heaven, might this thing be? And he said, Behold, thou shalt see it with thine eyes, but shalt not eat thereof. And I want to focus on verse 3. This starts to get parenthetic here. So it's, it kind of stops the, the story of the fighting and of the war and what's going on there. And it starts focusing on these two guys. And it ties in later with the story. But right here it says in verse 3, And there were four leprous men at the entering in of the gate. And they said one to another, Why sit we here until we die? Why sit we here until we die? And that's the title of my sermon. Why sit we here until we die? And I'm going to preach about wasted time and wasting your life. Turn to Psalms chapter 103 verse 13. Psalms chapter 103 verse 13. Psalms chapter 103 verse 13. And my first point tonight is going to be that life is short. Life is short. I'll read to you from Proverbs chapter 27 verse 1. The Bible says... Boast not thyself of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. <coughs> Boast not thyself of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. Now, a lot of times, you know, we can go to like fa- uh, family gatherings, or sometimes it might even be like a church event. And you'll start talking to somebody that's at that event, and they'll be real enthusiastic. They'll be real excited about something, some goal or some accomplishment that they're planning on doing, something that they want to, that they want to do within the next year or they want to do in the next couple of months or something, and they're real excited about it. This may be like in the secular, secular world. Maybe it's somebody that you know, wants to start a business. Or maybe it's somebody that wants to move to some remote area, whatever it may be. It might be a person from church that's saying, hey, I want to be a missionary, or hey, I want to do this. I want to be a pastor. And then the next time you see that person might be six months, maybe a year. And since, you know, when somebody really puts an impression upon you about stuff like that, that's the first thing you think of when you see that person the next time. And you'll come up to and ask them like, hey, how's it going? How's your goals going? And so oftentimes will people answer you and they'll, t- they'll, they'll tell you, you know, well, I kind of put that off for a little while. And the, most people will never just say to you, yeah, you know what? I just changed my mind. If they're real excited about something like that, Normally, it's got something to do with, you know, they're procrastinating. And they'll tell you, you know, I'm just, you know, I'm not going to do it right now, but I'm going to end up doing it later. And they'll always say this phrase. They'll always make this statement. I have all the time in the world. And that's the exact opposite philosophy of what the Bible teaches. That's the exact opposite of what we as Christians on how we should look at our lives and how we should be living our lives. Look at Psalms, as I said, Psalms chapter 103, verse 13. The Bible reads, Like as a father pitieth his children, so the Lord pitieth them that fear him. So he's talking about that he feels sorry for us. Look at verse 14. For he knoweth our frame. So when he says frame, he's talking about our body. For he knoweth our frame, he remembereth that we are dust. Now keep reading. Verse 15. As for man, his days are as grass. (coughs) As a flower of the field, so he flourisheth. For the wind passeth over it, and it is gone and the place thereof shall know it no more. So when God is going to try to explain to us what our lifespan's like, you know, how long, if he tries to liken something in this world to give us a better concept or a better idea of how long we're going to be here on this planet, God says that your life is like grass. He says you're like a single blade of grass that's here today and then you're gone tomorrow. He says you're like a flower and then the wind blows and you flourish and then you're not there anymore. You're completely gone. Turn to Psalms chapter 102, verse 3. Psalms chapter 102, verse 3. <clears throat> <coughs> so I'm going to spend, I'm going to try to spend, thank you. I'm going to try to spend a lot of time on this first point because I think this point is the most important of all of them. It's kind of like when you're giving the gospel to somebody. If they don't get the first point that, hey, you're a sinner, something needs to be fixed. Hey, you deserve to go to hell. 
The rest of the sermon, uh, the rest of the presentation of the gospel doesn't help you at all. And that's the same thing with this sermon. This topic, if you don't get this first point, then you're going to be wasting your time listening to the rest of the sermon. You have to get the first point. You have to grasp it very firmly. So look at Psalm chapter 102, verse 3. Psalm chapter 102, verse 3 says this. For my days are consumed like smoke, and my bones are burned as an hearth. Now look down at verse 11. <coughs> Because of thine indignation and thy wrath, for thou hast lifted me up and cast me down. Now watch, or, I'm sorry, I read verse 10. Look at verse 11. My days are like a shadow that declineth, and I am withered like grass. So again, we see him making the exact same comparison, that my life is like grass. And there he also says something else. He says, he says my life is like a shadow that declines. You know, your shadow that's there for a few, you know, just a few hours throughout the day until the position of the sun changes, and then it's gone. He's trying, to, he's trying to explain to you that your life is temporary. You don't have a lot of time on this planet. You have a very, very few years on this planet, very short amount of time. 2 Samuel chapter 14, verse 14 says this, For we must needs die, saying we're all going to die, and are as water spilt on the ground which cannot be gathered up again. <coughs> Neither doth God respect any person, yet doth he devise means that is banished, be not expelled from him. So he says there again, he says, for we must needs die. We're all going to die. Obviously, we know that. You know, it's appointed unto man once to die. We're all going to die one day. And then he says, and we're as, we're as water spilt on the ground. So he, he compares us then unto water. How long is water going to be out here, especially in Phoenix? Not very long. It's not going to be there very long. And then he says this, at the very end of that, he says that it cannot be gathered up again. So he, he gives you another point there that once you die, you're gone. This isn't a video game that you get to retry. You don't get a second chance. You get one life, and you're here for a very short amount of time. Once that time's gone, you don't get another try. You don't get another chance. Turn to 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23. <coughs> 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23. I'll read to you from 1 Chronicles chapter 29, verse 15. The Bible says, For we are strangers before thee, and sojourners as were all our fathers. Our days on the earth are as a shadow, and there is none abiding. Talking about people. He say, our days on this earth are as a shadow. Just like he said it before, your, your days are like a shadow that declineth. It's here for a while, and then it's gone. And then he says here the exact same thing. Our days on this earth are as a shadow, and then he says, and there is none that abideth. Nobody stays here forever. You have a short amount of time. I'm going to read also to you from uh, Psalms chapter 78, verse 39. Psalms chapter 78, verse 39 says this. <clears throat> For he remembered that they were but flesh. And he's talking about the children of Israel when they were in the wilderness. For he remembered that they were but flesh, a wind that passeth away and cometh not again. So again, you see those same two elements again. It's something that's temporary, number one. Just the wind that passes away. It just comes by and then it's gone. And then he says at the very end that it doesn't come again. You don't get a second try. You don't get a second chance. So you're in 1 Peter chapter, chapter 1, verse 23, we'll begin reading there. 1 Peter chapter 1, and then in verse 23. The Bible says, Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. For all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man as the flower of grass. The grass withereth, and the flower thereof falleth away, but the word of the Lord endureth forever." And this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto us. So God tries to look at the natural world and he tries to give us, give us an idea. He tries to liken the span of our life because he's eternal. And we have to compare things unto this world when we look around and we're going to learn things. So he looks at our life and, he's, and he tries to find things to compare it unto. And he doesn't compare it to a tree which lives for hundreds, you know, yea, thousands of years. He says that your life is like a, tree, is like a, a, a grass. It's like a, a single blade of grass. He says that your life is like a flower. He says this over and over again. And if you take notes in your Bible, you can write down that this is actually a quote from Isaiah chapter 40, verse 6, that says, The voice said, Cry. And he said, What shall I cry? All flesh is grass, and all the goodliness thereof is as the flower of the field. The grass withereth, the flower fadeth, because the Spirit of the Lord bloweth upon it. Surely the people is grass, the grass withereth, the flower fadeth, but the word of our God shall stand forever. Now turn over to James chapter 4, verse 13. 
Whoops. James chapter 4, verse 13. Now, this is a recurring theme. It's not something that's just found in a couple of epistles, a couple of Old Testament passages. It's all over in the Old Testament. It's all over in the New Testament. And, you know, obviously the Bible is our final authority. When I hear something out of the Bible, I believe it. But besides that, you can go out there and you can talk to plenty of old men and old women that live in this city. And you can ask them the question. You know, I don't care if they're 95 years old. I don't care if they're 120 years old. Ask them, how long did it feel like you were on this earth? How long did it feel like that your life was? You know what they're going to say? It felt like it went by like that. It felt like I was here today and gone tomorrow. It felt like it was like grass that withers. You know, it's here for a period of time and then it's gone tomorrow. And whether they had a goal for something secular or whether they had a goal for something spiritual, they'll have the same answer. Most people, if you say, hey, do you feel like you did what you wanted to do in this life? I sh I'm positive that most of them would say, no, I had a lot of things I wish I would have done. And you could go to another Baptist church and find somebody that's that same age and say, hey, do you feel like you serve God to your full maximum, to your full capability? What do you think they're going to say? They're going to say, no, I wish I would have done a lot, lot more. I wish I would have done a lot more. Now look down at, uh, I'll read to you real quick too from Psalms chapter 39, verse 4. Lord, make me to know mine end and the measure of my days. <coughs> what is it that I may know how frail I am? Behold, thou hast made my days as an hand breath. And a hand breath is the, one of the smallest measurements that they had. That's why he uses that, to try to give you an explanation of your life, to give you an illustration of your life. And then he says, And mine age is as nothing before thee. Verily, every man in his best state is altogether vanity. And we're going to see that, that word used over and over again here in a second. Is altogether vanity, Selah. Now, you're in James chapter 4, verse 13. If you, like I said, if you take notes, this is also a quote of what I read earlier from Proverbs chapter 27, verse 1. Now, James chapter 4, verse 13, the Bible says this. <clears throat> go to now, ye that say today or tomorrow we will go into such a city and continue there a year and buy and sell and get gain. Whereas ye know not what shall be on the morrow. For what is your life that is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away? For that ye ought to say... If the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. <clears throat> so, so far we've had, we've had God give us illustrations of a shadow. We've had God give us illustrations of water that spilled on the ground. And then we also <clears throat> had him give us illustrations of a flower and of grass. Over and over again, things that have a very small, very short existence in this life. And then right here... He says that our life, he even defines it. He says, what is your life? And then he says, it is as a vapor. So if you look around at this world, you know, out of everything that exists in nature, one of the, one of, uh, of, of the elements that has the shortest lifespan or shortest existence in nature that's observable to our eye is, is a vapor. It's a vapor that's here today and then it's just gone tomorrow. So we need to get a grasp on what the Bible teaches as far as what's our life like? Because there's a lot of Christians walking around today that says, hey, I'm going to start serving God later. Or, hey, I'm going to start soul winning. I'm going to be a great soul winner, but I'm just not ready to, you know, to, to get out there and to start doing you know, all this. These are all warnings, my friend. These are all everything that we've read so far. Amen. These are to warn you that you are not going to be here very long. You're going to be here for a very short time. Your life is very, very short. And the time that you have to serve God and to worship God, to read His Word, to go out soul winning is not very much. You have very little time upon this planet. And if you sit there today and you say, hey, I don't agree with this. You know, I think I have all the time in the world. Then you don't have the Bible's philosophy. You're not getting your ideas and what you believe from the Bible. You're getting that from the world because the world is the one that says, I have all the time in the world. I have all the time in the day to do whatever I want. That's not what the Bible teaches. And that's step one. And you want to know why all these fundamental Baptists are scaling back all their, all their soul winning and why all these weak, watered-down pastors aren't reading their Bible? It's because they feel like they all have all the time in the day. When they don't, they don't have any time. They have very little time left, hardly any. And if they would have the right philosophy, a lot more people would be getting saved. Amen. A lot more Bible would be getting read. Right. A lot more would be getting done for the cause of Christ and for the kingdom of heaven. 
Yeah, and, and they wouldn't be, you know, all these, all these pastors across the nation, we wouldn't have to stand in the gap and, and, and try to find a bunch of people, you know, to make up for a bunch of, you know, lazy, weak, watered-down pastors if, it was, if they had the, read their Bible in the first place and had the right philosophy to begin with. Yeah. Yeah. That's what we need to do. We need to get in the Bible. And before you believe something, and when you start thinking, hey, you know, I think this is, you know, I think this is reality. I think this is the philosophy that I have. You better have a Bible verse to back it up right. is what you better have. You better, you need, you need to stop right there and say, hey, where did I get that from? Because, you know, if you, if, you, if you think that it doesn't cause harm and it doesn't hurt things, you're wrong. It does. It hurts a lot of stuff. It hurts a lot of things that are going on in our world. Turn to, uh, <coughs> excuse me, turn to Colossians chapter 3, verse 1. Colossians chapter 3, verse 1. <coughs> Colossians chapter 3, verse 1. So the first point is that life is short. Now, this is kind of a sub-point. This second one is kind of a sub-point. <coughs> and that's that because life is short, once you understand that idea that life is short, you don't have much time, then you need to stop paying attention to temporal things. You need to stop. That should make you to stop spending and wasting your time and sitting there until you die and doing nothing. Now, <coughs> look in Colossians chapter 3, verse 1. Colossians chapter 3, verse 1. <coughs> excuse me. The Bible says, <coughs> excuse me. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, <coughs> not on things on the earth. For ye are dead, and your life is hid, <coughs> excuse me, with Christ in God. So once you get it through your head, <coughs> thank you. Once you get it through your head, you know, that life is temporal, that life is short, it should change the way you think as a Christian. Because here's the thing, even if, a, even if an unbeliever understands that, you know, he's just going to go out and he's just going to destroy his life. If he thinks, hey, you know, my life's short, I have little time, he's probably just going to go out there and just do all kinds of horrible wickedness and all that stuff. But a believer, a Christian that knows, hey, I'm going to heaven when I die, and, and starting right now in my life, everything that I do, or, or from, the, from the point that I was saved, everything that I do can give me rewards in eternity, and I can start storing up treasures up in heaven. That should change the way that you think about your life. That should change the way that you live daily. You, shouldn't be making, you should be making different decisions than you did before you understood that, before you comprehended that. And that's a major truth in the Bible that's all the time discussed over and over and over again. Now turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 10. <clears throat> and you can look at somebody's life and you can tell what's important to that person. You can tell what, even what their priorities are by what they neglect, what they choose to neglect and then replace it with, or what they choose to spend their time on. If somebody reads their Bible a lot, you know, they love the Bible, they love God. If somebody goes soul winning a lot, they love God, they want to be obedient to Him. You know, because He said, if you love me, keep my commandments. And they also have compassion on people and they care about people that are going to hell. You can read a lot by people's actions. You can tell a lot about people's actions. Now, <clears throat> there are people that are going to get saved. And they are literally going to get saved and then live their entire life upon this earth. And they will die and they will go to heaven. But they won't have a single reward for eternity. Now, eternity is a powerful word, a powerful idea, even in the sense of an unbeliever going to hell. That's powerful. Mm -hmm. But even, even in heaven, obviously heaven's great. You know, but I want to do as much as I can. I don't know about you, but I want to do as much as I can. And if I can earn many rewards, and I know, hey, starting today, that I'm going to start serving God to, you know, to my full potential. I'm going to take it to another level so that I can earn rewards in heaven, so that I can please God, that should change the way you think. When you know that, 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 that that's a possibility, that should, that should entice you to do more for God, yeah. you know, to try to work harder for God. These things should mean something to you. Now, I'll read you quickly from 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 15. You're in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 10. We'll get there in just a second. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 15 says this, For all things are for your sakes, that the abundant grace might through the thanksgiving of many... Redound to the glory of God, for which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, there again he's talking about how, how short his life is, 
worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. So he's saying when you compare the two of this light affliction, he says, you know, and Paul had some serious stuff happen to him. He says this light affliction, which is just for a short period of time. He says at the end of that verse, he says that it works for, for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. When you compare the two. <clears throat> While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. It spills over to the next chapter too, verse 1 in, in chapter 5, 2 Corinthians. For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God and house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. So even though this life is short, and even though we're not going to be here very long, God balances it out. And he says, you know, what we do in this life, God will reward us for it in eternity, and you'll have those rewards forever. It's not just something that you get for a period of time. So even though, like I said, we won't be here very long, you know, it's, it's true. You know, our life is as grass, it's as vapor, it's as water spilled, spilled on the ground. We're not going to be here very long. But the time that you do spend serving God and doing things for God, you're going to re be rewarded that much more and you're going to have those rewards for eternity, forever. You'll have them with you the entire time. Now you're in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, and I mentioned a minute ago that, <coughs> that there's going to be people that get saved and that go to heaven and they will literally have no rewards for the rest of their life. Hey, if they're in heaven, that's awesome, praise God. I mean, that's obviously a lot, lot better than, than the alternative. But hey, I want to get rewards. I don't want to just be a mediocre Christian and just be happy with going to heaven, you know. And my pastor back home used to always say this, that he had a guy, the guy wasn't even saved. And he tried to give the gospel to this guy all the time. And he had the idea of work salvation. And he would tell him all the time, like, you know, you, you know he, he'd give him the gospel and you need to, you know, believe on Jesus. But after you believe in Jesus, you know, he'd talk to him about, you know, how you can earn rewards. Just try to entice him just to listen to him. Because this guy worked with him. He gave him the gospel tons of times. And he said, <clears throat> after, after he would tell him that, he, he was still just so, he couldn't even understand the gospel. And after he'd tell him that, he'd say, you know, if I ever do get to heaven, I'll be happy just washing the gates. You know, which is silly, obviously. And he would always, and my pastor would always tell him that, no, he said, yeah, if you're in heaven, you're going to be happy you're in heaven. But you don't really mean that. You wouldn't be happy just washing the gates of heaven while everybody else is inside and they have all these rewards and everything like that. And that's how everybody is. That's how everybody should be or you don't have any motivation. You're, you know, we shouldn't have this just laid back attitude where we just don't care about the things of God. You know, a person that's zealous for God wouldn't be just happy washing the gates or shining somebody's shoes or being the doorkeeper in that situation. So look at 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 10. The Bible says, According to the grace of God which is given unto me, as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereupon, thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. For other foundation can no man lay... Then that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. So he's talking about your salvation. When a person gets saved, they have that foundation laid. And, you know, and that foundation, no other foundation can be laid after that. That person's going to heaven no matter what. But keep watching. Now, if any man build upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare. Talking about the, day, the coming day of judgment. Because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. And a lot of people just stop reading right here too, but it does, the context does not end yet. If you keep going, you'll, we'll see a lot of common words that we've heard so far and a lot of words that we'll see here in just a minute when we look at another, a couple other connecting passages. But this person, when it's talking about wood, hay, and stubble, it's talking about them living a life of vanity, a life of foolishness, a life that they've wasted, that it wasn't lived for God. It wasn't lived for Jesus. It wasn't time spent reading their Bible. It wasn't time spent, you know, discipling other Christians or, you know, coming to the church and just doing things that pertain, you know, to God and to the kingdom of heaven. It was just wasted time. That was the wood, hay, and the stubble. Then the things that were actually rewards, that wood, 
When they're tried by fire, they're just going to be purified. Gold, silver, precious stones. Now the wood, hay, and stubble, like I said, is just things that are vanity. Keep reading. If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. Let no man deceive himself. See, he's on the same subject. Let no man deceive himself. If any man among you seemeth to be wise in this world, let him become a fool that he may be wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. For it is written, he taketh the wise in their own craftiness. And again, the Lord knoweth the thoughts of the wise that they are vain. So he contrasts the wisdom of the wise and then the foolishness of this world. Now, I'm going to have you turn over to, uh, I'll have you turn to Ephesians chapter 5, verse 16. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 16. I'll read to you another passage. Like I said, I want you to keep that in your mind. The vanity on one side, a, a life that is wasted. Like sitting there until you die. Why sit we here until we die? Just wasting your whole life doing nothing for God. And if you sit there and you think like, like man, you know, I, you know I, there's all this time in the day. It's very easy to let your life just fly by with that type of attitude. That's the attitude that'll just make it go by even faster. When you just live this, this laid back attitude when you're doing nothing. That's the type of way to just, you know, throw your whole life away. I'm going to read to you from 2 Peter chapter 3 verse 9. It says, the Lord is not slack concerning his promises, some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Now watch what he says. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness? See, the world doesn't know that this is coming. The world doesn't understand. In this same pa uh, passage, they're asking, you know, when, you know, when is he coming back? You know, what's the sign of his coming? They, they're acting like he's never come. They don't, they don't realize that Jesus Christ is coming back to this world. So it makes sense for them to waste their time. That's why Peter says, seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all, in all holy, holy conversation and godliness? Because you know that this is temporary, because you know that your life is short, you should that much more take every second that you get to serve God. Yeah. You should that much more take every advantage that you have, you know, to live for God and to go soul winning. Any opportunity that you have. I'm going to keep reading. It says, looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, looking for new look for new heavens and a new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. And he says again, another warning in the same passage. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that ye look for such things. So because, you, you know, because you're saved and you're waiting for, for Jesus Christ to come back. Be diligent that ye may be found of him in peace without spot and blameless. And then verse 15 an account that the long-suffering our Lord is salvation, even as our, our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom. Notice the wisdom. A wise person, and my next point is this, a wise person redeems the time. A wise person is someone that realizes, hey, life's short, I better take advantage of every second that I can. I better, any chance that I have that church is open, you know, it, it wouldn't be wise for you just to stay at home. It wouldn't be wise for you to not come to church. You should come to church any opportunity that you have. If you're just sitting home and you're not doing anything, you know, you have no responsibilities during soul winning, go soul winning. Go with the group if there's a time. Every opportunity that you get, if you're standing around, you know, at a marketplace or something like that, pull out your phone and start memorizing scripture. Amen. If you're sitting around and you have your Bible there, but you pull out your phone and get on Facebook, no. <laughs> You need to get your Bible out. You need to redeem the time. Right. You, you don't have much time. The very little time that you have, you need to make sure that every second is, is for the kingdom of heaven. Amen. Every second is for God. Why sit we here until we die? Because that's what a lot of Christians are doing. They're just wasting their life. Completely wasting in their life. I bet there is going to be so many Christians when we get to heaven that all their works are going to be burned up. They're going to make it in, but they're not going to have any rewards. I don't want to be in that group. I want to be up there and I want to have as many rewards as I can get. I want to get as much honor as I can from Jesus Christ. 
Right. I don't want to get up there and, you know, and, 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 and not have a crown and not have jewels in my crown. Look at, uh, you're in Ephesians chapter 5. <clears throat> Ephesians chapter 5, verse 16. So my first point, like I said, <coughs> is life is short. My sub point to that is because life is short, we need to make sure that we're, that we're spending our time for, etern for eternity's sake, for things that are eternal, not things that are temporal. And then my third point here is because life is short, we need to redeem our time. We need to redeem our time. Look at Ephesians chapter 5. We'll start reading in verse 14, actually. Wherefore he saith, Awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. See then that ye walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. That means like, the, like, like he said before, that you're diligent, that you're looking around, that you know what's going on. Circumspectly, that means, spec comes from like, that you're looking. That's talking about your eyes. Circum is talking about in a circle, around about you. That means that you're aware of everything that's going on, that you're not sleeping like he just said. Amen. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as wise, but as, not as fools, but as wise. Notice that keeps coming up. Not as fools, but as wise. That's because a fool wastes his life on this earth. A fool doesn't understand, hey, I'm going to be dead soon. You don't even know. And here's the thing. It, God's not talking about, he doesn't differentiate between somebody that lives until they're five and when they're 95. He just looks at you in one category and says, your life is as a vapor. Right. You could die tomorrow, like it said in James 4. You don't have the promise of tomorrow. You have no idea what's going to happen. So keep look at, look at verse 16 where it says next. Redeeming the time because the days are evil. Turn to uh, Colossians chapter 4 verse 5. Colossians chapter 4, verse 5. So we need to redeem the time. Like I said, we need to redeem the time going door to door. We need to redeem the time reading our Bible. We need to redeem the time every opportunity that church is here, that you have an opportunity to come and serve in whatever day. You need to redeem the time. Redeem the time memorizing scripture. If there's men that want to be pastors one day, you need to redeem the time. We need pastors out there real, real bad because the Independent Fundamental Baptist movement is a total failure right now. And, the, and, and what we have is a lot of weak, watered-down pastors standing behind the pulpit who are still holding on the coattail of the last generation, but they're nothing like them. Right. And they want to keep throwing their names around, you know, whoever, whoever you like in the Independent Baptist movement, they are nothing like the last generation at all. And that's why, so much, that's why we have so many problems in all these churches of all the sin that's going rampant. And, and when you look around and you go in there, you can tell it's a bunch of people that don't love the Lord, that aren't interested in their Bible. I've been to a lot of independent Baptist churches growing up, and, and there, is no, there is no zeal in any, hardly any of the churches anymore. None of them are zealous. Why aren't they going soul winning? Because they're not zealous, because they don't care. They're not compassionate for people because they're not reading their Bible. They're not redeeming the time. They think you know, that they have all the time in the world because they're not reading their Bible. And they want to keep saying, hey, I'm an independent Baptist. I'm an independent Baptist. Change your name. No, you're not. You do not stand for what the past generation stood for. You guys are weak. You guys are watered down. And that's why, a bunch of, that's why all the men that want to be pastors one day, they need to redeem the time. They need to take it real, real serious. All the qualifications, hey... If you have, li listen to me, seriously, everybody who wants to be a pastor one day, if you have five years left on one of your qualifications, say it's something like, like, you know, your marriage. Let's say, you know, you have to be married for four years. You just got married. You better have your Bible read 10 times and then be ready to leave and have all the other qualifications done on your anniversary. It can be your wife's present. We're moving to Florida, honey. Yo, we need, you, you guys need to, you know, be ready. You guys need to be prepared and ready to leave. You know, you need, you need to not want to just sit here until you die. You need to be ready to get out the door and plant some other churches out there to try to, you know, do whatever change that we can. Whatever, you know, however many people we can get saved, you know, now. There are so many people, you know, like in Nashville where Brother Miller's going or Florida, Jacksonville, Florida, where I'm going to go. There are so many people once you get there. I'm sure that are sitting around not soul winning because the only churches in their area aren't soul winning. And they need a leader to get to their area. And then there's people here that aren't doing the reading. There's people here that just don't show up, to, you know, whatever it may be, whatever, whatever it is. We need to redeem the time. We need to make sure that we're taking it serious. You need, if, you know, if you have some qualification that you need to meet, mean it, meet it before that last day. Any second that you have, get out the door as soon as you can. Churches are needed like really badly right now. Yeah, right. Really, really, really badly. And that needs to sink in. 
That's why I said, that if the number one point, if you get that, life is short, that will compel you and that will motivate you to get going. If you get it, hey, I'm not going to be here very long. That might wake you up a little bit and say, hey, you're right, I need, I need to start doing something. I, honest to God, I honestly think that to myself. You know, if I lay in bed in the morning and I feel lazy or something, I feel like I don't want to get out of bed, I think that thought to myself. What is this going to do to me when I'm 50 years old? How far is it going to get me? Or if I'm standing around or I should be doing something, I think that thought to myself all the time. I try to picture myself when I'm, like, when I'm older and try to think, what is, where is this getting me, what I'm doing right now? You guys need to get that in your mind. You need to motivate yourself. Everyone that wants to be a pastor, everyone that wants to serve in the church. You know, when you get that thought in your mind, hey, life is short, I need to redeem the time. That will, you know, push you. That'll get you going. So I had you turn to Colossians now. Colossians chapter 4. Colossians chapter 4, verse number 5. We see it again. Walk in wisdom. Notice you keep seeing that word wisdom because a foolish man wastes his life. Walk in wisdom toward them that are without, redeeming the time. Now turn to Psalms chapter 90, verse 12. Psalms chapter 90, verse 12. And this passage actually encompasses my, I feel like it encompasses the, the points of my sermon perfectly. <clears throat> Just all the points and the whole concept that I want to get across. <clears throat> Psalms chapter 90, verse 12. So, the title of the sermon is, Why Sit We Here Until We Die? Point number one is, life is short. So we shouldn't be looking at temporal things. We should be looking at eternal things, spending our time on things that are eternal. And then the last point is because of that, we need to be redeeming our time. Now look at Psalm chapter 90, <clears throat> excuse me, verse 12. The Bible says, So teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. See wisdom again, over and over again. And then verse 13, we'll just, we'll just finish out reading another one. Return, O Lord, how long, and let it repent thee concerning thy servants. So he says that, and, and when, when one, of my, or one of my nieces have a birthday, I always send this. We'll write it in the card, and I'll send this while they're growing up. And so it says there again, so teach us to number our days. If you knew you were going to die tomorrow, would you be happy with what you've done for God so far? If you, if you knew that you were going to die today, I don't think anybody in this room would say, I'd be satisfied with my life right now, and I'm ready to stand before Jesus. I don't think there's a single person in this room. I want to do way, way more. Amen. Yeah, so we need to redeem the time. Don't sit there until you die. Don't just sit there until you die. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for this, this opportunity to gather here tonight, dear Lord God, and we thank you for, uh, for your word, dear Lord, that, can, that when we need it, sometimes it'll just wake us up out of this sleep and this slumber that we're in. And we ask you that you would light a fire underneath all of the, the men that want to pastor someday because that's extremely important uh, to have all, these, the, have all these churches out here and to help other people go soul winning. We love you, Lord, and help us to serve you with all our heart and help us to have zeal to, to read your word and just give us wisdom to understand it. And also just let us apply this message. And in Jesus Christ's name, amen.